Hello everyone. All right, so I want to talk to you guys a little bit about pain, abuse, um, misuse of power, um, and many people these past few months in my life has unfortunately been reaching out to me on the matter of unresolved hurt and wounds and church hurt. And I never really took much consideration to church hurt um, or the possibilities of people being afflicted in the house of God because in the house of God is when you're supposed to find spiritual positions. Jesus described himself as, as a physician. He didn't come for the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. Um, it's the sick that are in need of physicians. So many times when you or I may find myself find ourselves in a church setting, it's because we understand that there is a need that um, can be remedied by spiritual means through a Godhead, um, God the Father. And so we attend these gatherings. And because a lot of us have escaped much abuse, you know, and, and, and it's a blessing for some people who may not have a clue what I'm talking about. It's a blessing. But unfortunately, most of the world's population have dealt with some form of abuse in a sh one shape, form, or another. Verbal abuse, emotional abuse, mental abuse, physical abuse, um, psychological abuse. There's all types of abuses um, that people can experience. And it's just unfortunate because that just kind of just paints a picture of the fracture creation that we are in or 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 the the framework of of sin and what sin does if we stay within the framework of loving god and loving ourselves the bible tells us that that's the fulfillment of the laws and of the prophets and love we can by default be in a place that is acceptable to God and to one another, but we deviate from that. And because a lot of us deal with measures of fear and pride, we we kind of have a self-preservation mentality, uh, fight or flight or survival mode that kind of kicks in. And we're all just trying to survive till the next day, almost like the animal kingdom. When I would uh, watch certain uh, depictions of animals and and how they exist are my daughter recently said oh my god it's just sad to be an animal because it just seems like their only goal in life is to make it to the next day to eat and not be eaten and if the sun goes down and you made it to another day without being eaten you you overcame and life sometimes presents us these curveballs that are almost the same way like you're just trying to Make it till the next day. You're just trying to make sure that the day of salvation, you're not hardening your heart. You're making sure that the fiery darts of the enemy, when it comes your way, you're not trying to be overtaken by them or, or dismantled in any way. And so we're all running and trying to find refuge. And it's amazing when we can get to a place of humility within ourselves and say, God is the answer. And a lot of times when we get to the place where we realize that God is the answer, that is actually the start of a journey. It's not the conclusion. And it's unfortunate when we uh, decide that that's where we can find our help and our stay. And we might get caught up into something that is unexpected. And so you hear that. You hear those types of things going on throughout the world in different religions and different cultural cu cultures and, and different sects. Church hurt, church hurt, church hurt is just having to be afflicted or oppressed by authorities that are set over your life, whether they're mishandling their responsibilities or lying to you or just doing things that does something to the heart. We don't realize how fragile we really are until things are thrown at us and then we really can understand our frame. And sometimes we learn to survive and we learn to take on abuse.
when that's not supposed to be the way things are. And so I've, I've spoken to women who have been battered and have been in marriages where their husbands would batter them and how it begins to break them in their psyche. They begin to make excuses for the behavior or begin to put on the thoughts that they've done something to deserve the afflictions. And so they take it until something breaks. And sometimes what breaks is something that's going to be the hardest to repair. And it's going to take a hand of a loving, sovereign God to restore what has been broken from another. And so I want to talk about that because it's been brought to my attention and it's thing. It's, it's a, it's a subject matter that has kept me up praying for people who has told me certain things that's happened to them in certain settings, certain settings that I'm aware of in different settings that um, I haven't set foot in, but just being aware of the fact that, man, the one place you're supposed to find refuge and help, people are being hurt as well. What are people going to think about the church? And so that's why people like myself who have a righteous anger or an offense for the things that should not be happening are to cry aloud. It's to make a stance, to take one bold chance to change the world for everyone. I heard just last night that one bold individual who can actually have the courage to stand against what's wrong can change the world. And that is what my attempt is to change something that is fractured, that is help, that is hurting more people than helping them. Certain things just should not be happening to people who already are in need of help in a physician. When you go to the doctor, you're not asking for them to misdiagnose you or prescribe prescriptions to something that's not going to better you. You're expecting to come out with an outcome that's going to resolve the matter. That's what the house of God is supposed to provide. And so I'm familiar with one that does not provide that, unfortunately. So with this particular gathering gathering that I have been a part of for quite some time and I have come out of, one of the things that have been spoken that kind of makes everyone feel like they're okay with what they believe and what they are moving in or applying it is, is the, the idea that they were once one way and now being a part of this group of people, they are now a better person. And so you can have testimonies of people who have been game banging or part of, of criminal activities or just a theft or, or, um, unfaithful in their relationships or just addicted to certain substances that are foreign to the body. And it was bondage for them. Their previous life was bondage. It was sin. It should not have been the way that it was. And in that lifestyle, they knew that it was a matter of coming out or being overtaken by the lifestyle. And some people have been able to come out of the lifestyle and they find something else. Now I'm going to talk about it generally and then eventually I'm going to get into the scripture. I think about times where I've watched certain movies where people have gone into prisons and they spent a nice portion of their life in prison. And they come out of the prisons and they may have a parole officer or a probational officer or something that's someone that's holding them accountable to not returning back to the lifestyle. And when the person tells the accountability partner that they are now giving their lives to the Lord, that individual at times will laugh it off and say, oh, you found religion, meaning you found something to cope with. The idea that you are no longer who you used to be or you are attempting to not go back to the person that you used to be. So you found something. So when someone comes out of a setting like that, they go to church and they're trying to serve God. Awesome. Amen. The, the heavens rejoice for one sinner that gives their life to the Lord. And so, but the world doesn't understand how you can be apprehended by Jesus and he actually can transform your, transform your life. He can actually renew your mind. He can actually heal your heart of all brokenness and change your heart so that you can be different in everything, different how you perceive life, different how you respond to different challenges. Even how you begin to speak is just different. Jesus 
does that. And it's very upsetting to me when the power of God has been belittled or, or lessened or lowered just because we can't seem to tap into what is available to the hungry and thirsty ones. And so uh, accepting or tolerating a lack as opposed to pushing through and acknowledging there is more found in God. I don't have to just remain with the trickle, the, t the, the, the tap of water that is being dripped on me. That's not all that is available. God is a fountain that never runs dry, he said. He opens up the heavens and he pours out. But we have learned to accept the drips that comes from above that keeps us sustained in, in where we are. And I'm saying, you guys, there's more. I'm saying God is bigger than that. And he is highly exalted. And I'm saying you can press into God and really receive true outpour. You can really receive the true manifestations of God's hand. It's not just you found religion. You found the savior of the world. You didn't just find a system you, uh, that, that alters your behavior. We're not talking about behavior modifications here. We're not talking about having to learn how to uh, display yourself. We're talking about true change of identity from one person to the next. So people have been talking about how this particular group that they are a part of, that they were once evil criminals, hard, a nuisance to family and society. And the testimony is now that being part of this group, they are no longer criminal in both the eyes of God and the society. They're no longer unfaithful. They're no longer addicted to pornography. They're no longer addicted to, to drugs or, or, or alcohol. And they're accrediting that to the gathering. They're accrediting that to the leader of the grad gathering. I've heard people who have escaped death because they were living criminal lives, trying to run for their lives and seek some kind of refuge. And being a part of this gathering is what they believe have saved their lives. First of all, no one should take glory away from God. It's never a gathering that saves anyone from anything. It's never a leader that saves anyone from anything. No one has the power to save but God. No one has the power to, to forgive sins but Jesus. So when Jesus heals us, when Jesus forgives us, all glory, all honor and power belongs to Jesus. Not a setting, not a gathering. Not to say that God doesn't use settings. Not to say that God doesn't want us to gather. Not to say that accountability within structures of the, of the, of the scriptures, biblical principles does not aid people into prosperity. It does. But when we lose sight on who's in control, who we worship and who's bringing freedom and deliverance, that's when things begin to alter. So I don't want anyone at this point to believe that behavioral modifications or learning to Adopt a way of living is what changes you into a good person. No one's good unless Jesus says they're good. No one is righteous unless through Jesus they are made righteous. Our righteousness, our efforts, our works are as unto filthy rags, the word of God says. So the more I want to be truly trained and no longer criminal to the world or to God, I've got to be made more like God. Listen, there's people that have gone into different organizations like the boys and girls club taking certain youths out of the world and off the streets and now they have mentors and these mentors don't have to be saved they don't have to know what it is to walk with god but they take these people these adolescents these young people off of the streets off of drugs off from selling drugs off from away from prostitution or stripping or any other thing that they may find uh to make means of existence and they bring them into a set where they began to imply certain principles in the natural that helps people to be better in general, begin to teach them how to 
Be someone of integrity in the natural. Learn, teach them the importance and the values behind finding education because when you educate yourself, there's power in education. You don't have to be the way that you used to be or, or be the a part of people that are around you in your life that are dying to this lifestyle. They pull you in, they mentor you, they raise you and you become someone different than you were. You even could become better than your parents without Jesus. Without the church, you got organizations in the world that people can say that, man, if it wasn't for this mentor or if it wasn't for this teacher or for or for if, if it wasn't for this program, I would still be on the streets where I would be dead. This program saved me. This this role model saved me. This organization saved me. People are saying that. You got false religions, and I'm not going to name any because there are so many, but you got false religions who are doing the same. They bring you out from a place of, of, of criminal activity, of mischief, of being a vagabond, teach you their ways, their beliefs, their conducts, and you begin to walk and implement them, begin to change your clothes, begin to teach you new doctrines, and teach you how to present yourself, and you are now no longer a problem in the world, naturally speaking. In the false doctrines, we're doing that. That's happening. So now what we have to identify and evaluate is what makes my so-called transformation or my testimony of change from who I used to be to who I am now different from these different organizations or people who are in false religions also because they're all testifying of the same thing. What we're looking for is the evidence of, hand, of the hand of God on our life. What we're looking for is the impact that we have to people in the world. What's the impact? Do God give me the power of influence? Has God given me strength to overcome the wiles of the enemy? Have I truly overcome or does it sound nice to say that about myself as I make strides to overcome? Let's talk about that. Let's talk about that, that in the fruit of the spirit is when we begin to see if we're really changed into the image and the likeness of Jesus Christ as he's modeled for us in the earth. Are we more loving? Do on the inside, we want to see someone prosper, even if they may be considered our enemy, or do we want them to feel pain and shame because we're offended? Where's our mentality with the love? Do we have true joy in what we are applying in our lives and under the beliefs and the leaderships do we ha we have? Are, are, is the joy that we have, the peace that we have, is it until something pokes and prods at you or provokes you and then the real issues of your heart really manifest? Or is the joy of the Lord truly your strength? Do you really have peace to surpass the understandings of people around you and you can hold on to the things that are pure and of virtue and of honest support and, and, and maintain a steady identity in the Lord? Where's your faith? How good are you with holding on to the things that you know are available, even though you can't see it, even though you don't know how it's going to manifest, but you know that God has spoken in the word or to you, you know that there are things that are available to the sons of God, the believers of God, and you are holding on to what is available more than just a little drip, but a open heaven. How, how well and strong are you in that? How anchored are you in your faith in God? Are you easily removed? Are you easily shaken? These are the things we're looking for. Am I slow to wrath? Am I, or, or am I quick to anger? Am I quick to forgive? Or am I, or, or am I burdened with offenses and unresolved matters of my heart? Am I kind? Can people read, read what I put on social media or hear my words and hear kindness, which is a law? Am I gentle? Naturally, am I, am I caring? Do I, am I gentle with people or am I brute and very harsh and unrelenting? Listen, these are what we can really identify as change. Are we being more like God or are we just learning to pretend? Are we putting on pretense? Are we walking on love feigned, feigned love, hypocritical love? Are we walking in dissimulation? Are we walking in dishonesties? Are we trying to deceive ourselves along with the world? 
Everyone can say that they were once doing something and they made some alterations and changes and began to look better and sound better. Everyone can say that. But a believer in Christ has to say that with the power of God and the evidence of true change. And change isn't that I'm okay until I'm not okay. Change is not I change the way I talk and whole handle people until they anger me. If you still have the same responses that you have and you still you still speak the same way that you did outside of what you've implemented that you are now crediting your change and testimony to, you have not been changed. If you are still bitter in how you talk, if you are still you, so now if you were someone who used to speak foul language to hurt someone, but now you've learned scripture and you're using scripture as a sword to anger someone or to proke and prod at someone or to judge someone, you have not been changed. In second, second Kings, um, chapter four, we are identifying this prophet Elisha. And the people of that time was dealing with a lack of food. And he was around a bunch of these prophets. And there was this famine in the land. And everyone that was around him obviously was feeling the effects of this famine that was in the land. And so he began to ask one of his servants or one of the prophets that were with him, a servant or so, to go and make some porridge or, or, or pottage or some kind of stew. And so they went or the servant went and started to gather whatever he can get a hold of in the forest or woods that was nearby them. So different herbs. I'm sure he was grabbing maybe some bears or whatever that was available. No specifics, just that he went and he began to gather what he could find in the field, different herbs, different wild vines. Um, and he, he grabbed enough to where he was full and he began to prepare it for this porridge that he was making for the sons of the prophet. And as he was preparing it, he began to serve certain ones that were with him. At some point, something went wrong. So I don't know if it's that someone began to get sick or someone was able to identify that one of the herbs or, or plants were poisonous. But one of them began to cry out, oh my God, oh my God, man of God, there's death in the pot. Meaning this is poisonous to us. If we continue to, to ingest this, that we're seriously going to be hurt and affected by it. And so the man of God, the prophet has to always have a solution. No matter how, how desperate of a matter you're in, whoever you're following has to have a solution that truly saves and change and protects you. And so the man said, okay, bring me some meal. And then the, 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 the servant brought the prophet some meal and he put it in the pot. Immediately the pot was fine. Whatever was causing the sickness, whatever was causing the porridge to be poisonous, it was no longer poisonous anymore. And then right after that, he, after he was able to heal the pottage from poison, they were able to eat of it. Everyone was fine. No one died from it. No one was affected by it moving forward. And then right after that is another record of this man that came from Bel, Bel, Shem, um, Bel Shile, Shilish. I'm, I'm, I'm sure I said that wrong. And he began to do something that you can read about in the book of the laws in Leviticus about giving your first fruits to, to, to the house of God in certain groups. And so this man implemented something of the sort and he gave this uh, same prophet that had resolved the poisonous pottage issue, some bread and some corn and some barley and different things. And he told the servitor that was with him, his servant that was with him to sit everyone down and to feed everybody. So this record reminded me of when Jesus on two different occasions were able to multiply the, the barley loaves and the fish and everyone was able to eat to their heart's content. The servant had the same question that the disciples had with Jesus. Man, we don't have enough. We have hundreds of men in this particular situation. We don't have enough to give. But yet this prophet was sure that God was going to come through with the bare necessities. We can't, we have to be people that have to move beyond questioning whether or not God is going to be strong enough to provide for our bare necessities. We've got to move beyond that. So this man is convinced that God at least feeds his children. 
That's fundamental Christianity, belief, faith in God. If we are struggling on provision, we need to first evaluate why am I forsaken? Because righteous people are never forsaken or begging bread. Or is this a matter of waiting still knowing that God, he is the one that delivers and provides two different occasions. The first scenario with the one, the man that had the pot that was poisonous kind of reminds me of when people who are desperate are looking for an answer and they can't seem to find the way, although they know Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. They know Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. They aren't aware that many people take his name in vain. And so they try to go on that, on this course to find true healing, true deliverance, true breakthrough from bondage, true transformation of identity. It reminds me of that. So go into the fields, find what you have in this drought, spiritual droughts. We can experience these spiritual droughts. We can experience the effects of the abuse, the mishandling of authorities in our lives. Parents, just as much as spiritual leaders, they have, they do this to us. And in the attempt in our droughts or in our famines, we gather whatever we can. We run into whatever we can because we're just trying to survive here. And so when we're preparing it, when things go wrong is normally when we're supposed to figure out what I did wrong or what was added to me that was wrong. We immediately can experience and detect that something's wrong. So in order to continue to, con uh, in order to continue on what we are perceiving to be wrong, we now have to override our conscience. We now have to give more leniency to the person that's adding the wrong, then we should. That's how we can continue in error. That's how we can continue in deception. And that's how we can continue in false doctrine. There's something that we have to now intentionally override or sear within our person because the Lord never allows us to be that vulnerable to where we cannot see or sense that something's wrong. So they, so this particular record shows that the servant did what this prophet did said. Now I'm not on any level showing that prophet Elisha is evil. He is a man of God. And we could read that from the beginning of his, his ministry to the, to the end where his bones was reviving dead people. So like, this is not what I'm saying because people can easily take words and make it something that I'm not saying. So he takes this, tells his servant to make the, the porridge, right? So the man is probably not paying attention as he should, which means we should be sober servants of God. We should be reading the word of God and in the intent to learn of God. We should be able to know what God is saying enough to when someone is contradicting to, 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 to the word of God, to take it to the Lord in prayer or to begin to arise questions of concern. So this man is almost like how we can be. We're just grabbing whatever we can find in the field because we're in a famine or we're in a drought. We're just, we're just desperate for an answer. Anyone that says anything that seems glamorous or makes me feel better than I feel in myself or make me feel like I've come out of something heavy and I'm in, I'm part of something better is what I'm going to add to this pot. I'm going to do that. I'm going to add whatever garbage along the way, whatever looks good from the exterior, but maybe inside rotten. I'm going to do that. It's not until I feel the effects is when something has to be said. But what happens if you're feeling the effects, but you're afraid to say, or you feel like you have to prove yourself in this area also because of the unresolved matters. You're going to continue to ingest the poison that's in the pot. In this record, it says there's death in the pot. Who gives death? The devil. He comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. But Jesus comes to give life and life more abundantly. I have to echo that. So whenever I am ingesting something or participating in something or holding on to something that's causing more harm than good, it's like I've taken on whatever I can find because I'm in a desperate situation and I'm ingesting it. Although I can smell that it's strange. Although my stomach is starting to turn. Although I'm starting to feel really dizzy. I'm going to keep on doing it because I can't allow myself to be wrong. That's pride. That's fear for somebody out there. It takes the man of God who fears the Lord God of, of heaven and earth to really have true solutions that can cause true change and sanctification in somebody.
that can cause a remission of sin and a, a true, ch a, a, a new creature being born. If any man be in Christ, behold, all things are passed away and all things are made new. If I'm a new creature in Christ, I can't speak to people when I'm angry the same way I used to speak to them in the world, although I'm omitting the profanity. It's coming from the same heart. It's coming from the same place. What's going on? People that are making us true, people that are adding to us and making us better than when we were, has to have the meal. What's the meal? The antidote, the true solution that's going to take away everything that is causing me to die. Everything that is provoking or promoting me to remain in my sinful state. That's keeping me from hearing from God and being truly changed. The light of God's presence transform you. So if you are to, to be in a place where you're ingesting or taking on things that is death to you. The people that you are with that are supposed to be adding to you ought to have the meal. Prophet Elisha had the meal and he put it in the pot and immediately it was safe for everyone to consume. Now, if we're going to apply it to scripture or spirit, whenever someone stands before me and is preaching to me according to the word of God and the will of God, it has to make me be impacted with the light of God's presence. There's a, my husband mentioned recently that the, the joy of God's countenance is what truly tells you that you are standing in faith. There's a countenance that you hold. There's an image that you bear that testifies of true change, the countenance of God. It goes beyond just what I'm professing of myself. Inwardly, I'm changed. Outwardly, the change on the inside manifests. So I no longer have to speak of myself well. People are going to speak well of me. That's the hand of God. That's a witness in the earth saying this person used to be this way and now they're not in the name of Jesus. So we are needing to follow people who have meal, the antidote, the answer, the solution, or call on to God and open the doors for the ones who are locked to go through onto the other side in the name of Jesus. We need courageous men of God that can call out to God and part Red Seas, not just bring us to the sea and we all just die off right there. We got out of Egypt, but we couldn't get over to the other side. That's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about. We need true change. We need power from heaven and only God can provide that power as we are following his precepts. We need to put away strange beliefs and we need to stop lying into ourselves and begin to humble ourselves in, at the hand of God so he can exalt us in due time. Listen, a lot of us are not okay. A lot of us are still very angry and very hurt and they don't know who to project the anger out on. A lot of us are confused with many questions, are just afraid to ask the right questions because they have no outlet to ask the questions. This is when you cry out to God the hardest, the loudest and more persistent because it's about surviving. Not just so that you can eat and see another day. It's about surviving this life so that you can live eternally in the Lord of God's, in the presence of, in the presence of the Lord God Almighty. Gotta get there. We gotta get there. You know, I've, I've, I've heard people be so hard and unrelenting that they forgot that Jesus who gave his all is who is teaching us. So when you hear people having issues with giving to the poor, when Peter, and the other apostles gave Paul the right hand of fellowship when they perceived that the power of God was on Apostle Paul just as much as it was on them. It said the word of God gave them the right hand of fellowship and that you should that you ought to remember the poor. It breaks my heart when I've I've heard ministers in the house of God standing against uh, in front of impressionable servants of the Lord telling his congregation that he would rather throw clothes away than to give it to the Salvation Army or the Goodwill or to someone poor on the streets because they're in sin. What kind of world or predicament we would be in if that's the way God saw us? The Bible says that he, while we were yet in our sins, Christ died for us. While we were still a 
foreign person in the spirit, while we were still alienated to the things of the kingdom of heaven, Jesus died for us while we were still in that condition, while we were still wallowing in our blood and in our filth. Jesus saw something deep on the inside of each and every being as existing today. And he died for them. Not because we can profit him anything. Man, we need Jesus more than he needs us. We delight the Lord. He finds delight in us. Just like how parents, when we have newborns, they don't do anything for us. We just love them. We delight in them. And we're going to invest and do whatever we can to make sure that these little human beings that's been given to us are going to grow up to be something that's going to make us glad that we've accomplished something and can better the world in the name of Jesus. And I'm praying that we all can grow and raise our children to be godly arrows. You know, I've heard pastors say things like that. Like, I don't give to the poor. If I have clothes and if I don't have a brother in the congregation that I give it to, I'd rather throw it away than to give it to the Salvation Army or the Goodwill. That is someone who's forgotten the poverty that they've been brought up out of. That's for, that someone forgets all of the days of bread and water. And now God is giving them in abundance and they don't know how to pour out on others who God is going to and can restore it on every day. We are needing to be more like God and we are needing to be at churches that can teach us the perfected love of God and not to teach us how to be hardened and not to teach us to, to, to contend against flesh. We don't fight against flesh and blood. The weapon of our warfare are not carnal. But mighty to what? The pulling down of strongholds. Casting down imagination. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. That's what we're doing. Sometimes we have some vain imaginations. That we need to come, uh, come against and tear down. In the name of Jesus. Sometimes every high thing that comes against the knowledge of God. We need to contend and resist it. Boldly in the name of Jesus. So that other people aren't entangled in the webs of deception. In the name of Jesus. Sometimes we got to walk in that patience which is an attribute of the fruit of the spirit to others who aren't aware that they are still broken and are in need of redeem redemption and you suffer long with these people which is another trait of of godliness suffering long with people who do not understand the ways of god who do not understand how they are in the spirit and are in need of tender loving mercy and the kindness of our god our dear savior jesus christ so today, if you are someone who believes you've been changed and you have the testimony, I'm not here to take away your testimony because God is bringing true transformation in the world. And I praise God if you are a true product of the true transformation. And I praise God if you are under people who have the meal that can remove what is poisonous from what you are ingesting or in the world in general. I'm glad for you. Most of us, that's not true. Most of us, when we're speaking of being changed, we've just found some modifications. We've just, we just found a way to conduct ourselves. That's not really changed at all because put you in a right situation, put you in a right offense, put you outside of your indirect setting without accountability. You will do what is still in you to do. That's how you know if you're changed or not. So that's my word of encouragement today that we need to really begin and ask God to bring healing. Healing starts off with first forgiving who has the people who have hurt you. And you need to begin to seek God for a pathway to salvation, true salvation. You have to consider the fact that you might have been wrong and you've wronged some people out there. And it's time for you to humble yourself so that God can restore you because he's doing it while you still have breath in you. He's still restoring and every day we're going to have to forgive. And every day we're going to have to love. And every day we're going to have to pray the best and strength for people who are still coming into the awareness of what God is. Don't lose salvation because someone just doesn't know what they're doing. It's your job to keep working it out. It's your job to seek first the kingdom of God. It's your job to call on the name of Jesus Christ so that he answers you. It's your job to search the scriptures, study yourself, show yourself approved in the name of our dear Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I, I love everyone. I bless everyone today with the grace of sobriety, that you rejoice with them that do rejoice and that you weep with the ones that do the weep and hold one another accountable that whether one member suffers, 
We got to have the mentality that all members suffer. And if one is honored, then we're all honored. We have to get to the place where we are one. We are one body. So weep with those who weep. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Suffer with those who suffer. Hold each other up. Bless somebody today. Bless and curse not. And let the Lord be the light of your salvation truly. We bless you. I thank you. Um, and let God continue to give you peace. Don't let anyone speak in your ear that is speaking strangely from what the Lord has already spoken. Give God your full attention because that's when he can begin to speak to you. I remember there's been times where I've been like, la, 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 just doing my own thing. And when I've had enough is when I was able to be still. And God is like, you ready to hear what I've got to say now? And I just love his patience. I love that he is so kind and that as you ask him to forgive you for the error or the, or, or the missteps, he forgives you and never brings that stuff back up. And all he wants you to do is find a way like, okay, now here, now don't get off this path again here. Now, don't follow strange voices again. Now, here, hold on to this because it's going to prosper you at some point or another. We're hitting checkpoints in our salvation. And it's the, in those checkpoints is when we remain or we begin to deviate. And I've got to know that at every season, I'm hitting those checkpoints accurately. And I'm maintaining the path that God has put me on in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I love everybody. And I hold no unforgiveness towards anybody. And I pray that you can say the same.